Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, yet again, we stop, we thank you, and we praise you for what we have seen you doing. We know that you're at work. We know that you're here with us in worship. We're listening closely. We're ready to learn. And even more, we're ready to see your face, yes, yet again. Guide us as we continue together in the second part of the series. Not only show us what you have for us, but even more, Father, show us your glory and what you want for us to do as we move forward together as a family of faith. Guide us and bless us. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, to say that she was excited would be a huge understatement. Oh, she was just a few days away from graduation, and her dad had promised that she was going to get a brand new car. What she didn't know is that it was brand new to her, but it was the car that was sitting in the garage for the past 20 years gathering dust. <laughs> graduation came and went, and that evening she sat down with her parents her dad had the keys in one hand and the title in the other. And he said, you know, before we do this, I have three conditions that I am going to see you through before you can have the car. And she's like, oh, dad, come on now. Still doing the teenage thing. Come on now, dad. Why can't you just give me the car? I've got a lesson that I, you need to learn before you can have the car. Okay, whatever. Tomorrow morning, we're going out. Be ready, eight o'clock. Okay, whatever, good night. Next morning, eight o'clock, right on the dot. Both of them are in the car and he says, okay, here's what's gonna happen. We've got three places that we're going to be going to. After the third place, that's when I will give you your car. Oh, she's so excited about this. Okay, whatever. Keys, please. Keys, please. I get to drive, right? It's my car. Mm -mm. This is still my car. I'm driving you to these places. Okay, whatever. Go to the first, first place. They stop at a used car place. Dad looks at the daughter, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out, get one of the sales reps, and bring them out here and ask them, okay, how much is this car worth? Goes in, gets the first person available, guy comes out, so how much is this worth? Well, okay, I'll give you $1,000, no more. Well, okay, thank you. Gets back in the car. That wasn't funny. I didn't say it was supposed to be. Now it's time to go to the next place. They, they pull out, go down the street a few blocks, and they stop right in front of a pawn shop. Pawn shop? Why are you bringing me here? This is your second lesson. Now go in, bring someone out, have them take a look at the car. She goes in, finds the associate, brings him out. And she says, I'm curious about selling this car. How much would you give it? Give me for it? And the man looks at it in mm, the back of his mind. Oh, I'm going to take her for a ride with this. I'm going to get as much money as I can from her. Oh, she won't know what hit her. And he goes, hey, I'll give you $100. No more. Thinking that she's going to sell that because, oh, she's that age. She'll sell anything for money. Girl looks at him, thank you. What? Oh, come on. Well, maybe 200. Nope. Mm -mm. Gets back in the car. You're really funny, Dad. Okay, where to next? And he said, well, what we're going to do, remember I have that membership down at the country club. Here's what we're going to do. We're going last place. We're going to go see your friends, some friends of mine. Okay, whatever. They go down get to the country club, park, and both of them go in. Get back in the back to where his friends were, and uh, they start talking, she starts sharing, he starts sharing about the car, 
And the, the friends go, mm, hold on just a second. We need to go see the car. So they go out and oh, all the dust and they look inside. They look at the specs. They open the hood, look at the engine. Oh, everything is good. Go back in. Dad and daughter sitting down, still waiting. They go, well, one more thing that we need to do. We need to go back into our private office and we need to talk. Ten minutes go by, they're still talking, still figuring this out. Come to a consensus, and they go out. Come back to the dad and daughter and said, okay, we've been talking about this, here's what we'll do. We will offer you $100,000 for this car. <laughs> she was floored. And dad's just sitting there smiling, and oh boy, dad's got another lesson. So she turns to him, why would you offer me $100,000? And they look at her and they smile and they say, because this is a classic car and it is worth its amount in money. As they go home, the dad turned to the daughter and he said, before I hand you the keys and the title, I hope that you've gotten the lesson. She's like, okay, what's the lesson? And he says, what others want to place a value on something is not the true value. Sometimes you need to go to find a second and a third opinion to find out what the true value is. Because value from one and value from another will be a drastic measure. And you need to know what is true in order to go forward. Even with saying that, Jesus continues to come back to each one of us from Genesis to Revelation, and he says, my child, remember your identity. Remember the very fact that how I measure you is different from how the world and Satan himself measures you. My value is so immense that I lay my life on the line because of you. That's how much I love you. I will bind this forever to myself and eternity to show you how much you really are. You are worth more than your weight in money, more than your weight in gold or anything else. Just trust me, follow me, believe that what I say is true and go forward in faith. You know, where we left off last week in Acts, Paul and Silas, had been chased out of Thessalonica. And they went to another town called Berea. Now from our scripture reading, and we'll be getting into this part of the story in just a moment, we see that the Bereans are people, people of the scriptures. They love spending, the, spending time in the word. Day and night, they're continually in the word, searching it for themselves making sure that they have a solid grasp on what's truly going on. Now, I hope you have your Bibles with you. Like always, whether that be hard copy or even electronic, either way, I want to invite you to join me in Acts chapter 17. Today we're taking a look in the story at verses 11 through 21. So let's take a look together as we get into this story. Let's get started. It says this, it says, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Right there, like we said, the Bereans were known throughout the land for being ones that searched. If anyone came and they were saying something that felt or seemed contrary to what they were taught, they didn't just sit back and go, well, here's something new, maybe we should take it, maybe we shouldn't, no. They kept going back to the original. They went back to the scrolls daily, not just once a month or once a year, it was multiple times a day, making sure that they were testing everything that was being said. But it's not just that. They were doing this with Paul himself. The one, 
The Bereans, more than anyone, knew who Paul originally was. They knew him by his original name was Saul, knowing that he had tormented, had persecuted, had done all these bad things to the Christians. And they're, in their minds, they're thinking, oh, you know, what if he's just doing a charade? Not only did they know this, but they knew him as the elite mind of Israel, the one that was destined to take Gamaliel's place because that's who he studied under. So they're testing everything because they want to make sure that everything is true, everything is sure. You know, even with talking about that, we see in even Paul's epistles and even other epistles from the other apostles that they continually come back and tell us that in everything, not just in some things, in everything, we need to be continually testing things. We need to make sure that it is lined up to the faith that is in Jesus and the faith that carries us home. Now remember, we're not home yet. We still are on this journey that Jesus is taking us on. But he continues to say, hey, right here, right now, I am starting new. I'm starting now. What's happening here and now? I am recreating. I'm redeveloping. I'm reissuing you into the people that I've called you to be. But even more, I'm making you into the people that will be safe for eternity, that I know that no matter what happens in eternity, this will not come to pass again. But Luke doesn't, doesn't just leave us right there with the story. <clears throat> we see these things and it continues on. Therefore, many of them talking about the Boreans believed along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. <laughs> Interesting. We see this again from what we looked at last week, that there is a people group that even though the Jews had a chance, they are being given the scriptures. They're given the truth that is in Jesus because all need to know. You've heard me say this before and I'll say this again. We have to remember that though God has a chosen group right here, it doesn't mean that the groups over there and over there and over there aren't chosen as well. God has his chosen people everywhere because that's how God works. But right here, what's amazing, we're, we're talking about a very patriarchal time. And to have certain people enter the equation is very important. We see people from the synagogue believe, but then Luke shifts focus and he says, oh, and by the way, again, there is a group of prominent people, both men and women. And with looking at this, especially in the Greek society of that time, we are talking about prominence within the hierarchy that was of Greece at the time. But not just that, it was a number of people that genuinely were searching. They sought, they wanted to believe. But Luke doesn't just throw that out and go, hey, there you go. He goes, hey, you need to know this so that the next will be understandable. Paul's doing what's right. This is why we see what comes next. But when the Jews of Thessalonica, uh-oh, here we go again, found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowd. These are people that they don't care what Paul is doing. They just want him ended. And the whole concept with agitating and stirring, the grammar puts it this way, is that it is a type of extreme storm. We can think of hurricane or a typhoon within our context now 
that is being, being caused to cause so much turmoil and tumult that it's going to give extra and utter destruction as it's going forward. But that's what they want. They want to do so much damage to what Paul is trying to do. But even more, is Paul the one that's doing this? No. Jesus is working through Paul for his glory. So often we talk about what this person is doing or what that person is doing and how they're doing this and that and this and that. No, we need to remember we are here to serve. Starting now, we need to have a whole shift, not just in paradigm, but in scope, where we understand that we are here to serve to the greater need that is Jesus Christ and what he continues to call each one of us to do. Every single one of us has a different call, like we see with Paul and Silas and Barnabas and other people. But these callings fit together in the greater puzzle called the journey of this life that starts from the very beginning of this world and goes to the very end. And each one of us has a piece to play in that puzzle to show others the greater glory of God's word and his, what he continues to do. But know this, if we're doing what God wants us to do, there will always be people that want to see us pulled down, torn down, or even just destroyed to the uttermost. We see this with Paul and Silas. But here's what amazes me continually. Even though this happens, God still has his people that continue to take care of the Pauls and the Silases and the others that are continuing to go out to deliver God's word. We see it right here. Then immediately the brethren, talking about the group in Berea, sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. <laughs> right there. Very interesting verse, isn't it? They, the people there, well, we don't want you to get hurt, Paul, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you on a boat, so we're going to send you away. However, Silas and Timothy need to stay. That, that can be confusing at times, but here's what we need to remember. We need to remember that the reason why they ask Silas and Timothy to stay is Timothy comes from Greek roots. He knows the people. He has a connection to this area. Silas is helping him as they're continuing to minister to these people. And so this is why they say, hey, Paul, you are the object of their attraction. So if we send you out, we can still keep going with this until you call us to come and be with you. Sometimes that's what we have to do when it comes to the ministry that God has placed on each one of us. Some of our cohorts might be called to go out and to do ministry other places, and then we join them again. When God calls us into those times, we need to be ready at a moment's notice to drop everything and just go because God's timing is precise. We serve an on-time and living God. God, when he plans stuff, doesn't plan stuff willy-nilly. He has a reason for why he says certain things and why he does it certain ways. We will not know and understand this side of eternity, but in that he continues to come back and say, even though you do not understand and you do not know, continue to trust me. Because starting now, I'm continuing a new thing that in this is going to carry out throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. But right here it continues. Now those who were escorting, who escorted Paul, brought him as far as Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible. They left. Paul has people with him. They get to Athens. Right there, Paul knows that he needs his cohorts with him. He knows, especially with being in Athens, he's going to be there a little while by himself. But he knows in order to reach the people, he needs the very people that have a connection to the inner workings of these people. 
But let's continue on with this story. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Right here, what we know from history and even historians, that this time of Athens was loaded with Greeks and Roman gods to the nth degree because of the different times that they had gone through. Now, what we don't understand is some of these Greek gods are Roman gods at the same time, just a different name. But Paul is so burdened because there is so much worship to these, these stones, these statues, these metals. But God himself isn't being worshipped, which that, that's where the twist comes because he's in the town of Athens, which was named for the goddess Athena, who was the goddess of wisdom. The reason why this town was named Athens is it was because it was known for its religious people. And even more than just that, it was known for the people that were extremely wise. Now, when was the last time that we went through a city that we were known to be the people of a city that were extremely wise. Or even the very fact that there are wise people within this city still. That seems to be something long, long ago and long while, while spent. But this is what Athens was known for. But Paul is hurting in his heart because he sees people that are needing the salvation of Jesus, but they're not given the chance. So he was reasoning in the synagogue, what he continually did, with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. Right there, he's taking a need and he's filling a need. Paul does not just sit silently when he sees people in need. You know, so often even with looking at this, Many people look at this and go, well, okay, this means that what Paul's actually doing is he's going and he's slamming the Greeks, slamming the Gentiles, and he's pushing this down their throat. No, what Paul is doing is he's going and he's meeting their basic needs. Probably what he did is he put up his tent making business and started making tents to start with. Okay, hey, you need some food? Let's go get something. Need a lodging? Here, I'll make a tent for you for free. Paul is doing something to connect with the people. But at the same time, he's telling them the stories of Jesus and his love. This would be something that was not new to the Greeks because they heard the stories as they were passed down through other people. So Paul continues, no matter where he is, he continues to talk about Jesus. And also some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers, not falafels, were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Right there, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Where we go and we try to tell others about Jesus and the very fact that he's alive and all that we get is, oh, they're just giving words of nonsense or, oh, they're trying to tell us something that really doesn't connect. Now, when we're telling others about Jesus, are we doing it from an angle that we shouldn't or are we telling them of who Jesus is? Do we have the connection with Jesus or is he such a stranger that we don't know him ourselves? Now, these are personal questions that each one of us need to face and need to, need to ask continually. But these people in Athens aren't sure fully of what Paul is trying to say. But this is where the story takes a drastic turn. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. 
for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Right there, they're hearing the town itself is a buzz with what's going on. And they're going, hey, we're people of wisdom. We got to know this. So what they do, think of it this way. Think of the biggest place, biggest lecture hall here in North America that you can go to. That's where, where they were going to. They had people that were renowned scholars on a daily basis. Actually, a lot of times they had from day to night people within this Colosseum that were continually talking about new stuff. And so they said, hey, psh, right here, we got to get this guy in here. But what we don't understand, when we think of someone coming to do a public presentation or to speak, we think about, well, you know, they've got to be mic'd up and, or mic'd up or whatever it is, all to the hilt. No. We don't realize how smart these Romans were. They built for sounds. As the person was in the center of the arena, they were able to project where even if you were in a place that would seem where it should get no sound, you would have crystal clear clarity. No matter where you were in that arena, the sound of the person speaking would get to you. So they tell Paul, hey, we got to hear. We as a town have to hear. Literally, the text basically says the town itself came out in droves, filling that arena, that coliseum. They wanted to hear this man. When was the last time that as we were telling, as we were sharing the stories of Jesus and his love, that people flocked to hear us? Not flocked to hear us because of ourselves, but flocked because they heard something new, they saw our experience, and they wanted part of that. That's what starting now is all about. We're starting something totally different where God is changing us. And because he's changing us and his love, mercy, and grace is flowing through us, it's changing others at the same time. But I want us to take a look at this very last verse with our context today. It says this, Now all of the Athenians and the strangers visiting they are used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Cool. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? It sounds as though these people, that all they were doing within the marketplace and within the Colosseum was spreading gossip. The words that are used within the grammar of this, they were so interested in knowledge that they kept talking about it. We saw in the beginning where it talked about with the Bereans, where they were noble-minded. That concept right there is the same concept at the end that we're looking at. They were people that they wanted to learn. They yearned for the knowledge of the truth. And noble-minded, within the context of the language, meant that they were open and ready to learn. You know, right now, God continues to speak back into us, telling us this, starting now, here's what I want you to, what I want you to be. I want you to be open, willing to sit, to listen, to learn, but ready to go back to the scriptures at a moment's notice to make sure that what is being said is true. Now, as we go into our final song of inspiration, may we continue to remember that as we think about what God is doing in us starting now. Let us pray. That's our prayer right now, Father. Help us to look to Jesus and Jesus alone. We know that there are many different things that you're going to have for us on this journey called life. 
We know that there's going to be times that we've got companions around us and times that you call us to minister alone. In all times, in all seasons, we ask that you keep our faces focused on you. Guide us, shine your glory through us. May we continue to be your broken vessels, but used for your honor and glory. Show us what you want us to do. Send us, Lord. Help us to serve. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, as always, I'm so glad that you've joined us today. And even more, on behalf of Safe Haven Ministries and the greater ministries that are, are, do, are done through the organization, we're glad that you join us every Sabbath afternoon for our program. And as I always mention, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I invite you out to join me on my blog site at districtdevotional.blogspot.com. Tuesdays, we've got the written devotional. Thursday, we have our video devotional as well. And even more than just that, I look forward to joining you next week as we wrap up this series, looking at what God continues to do through us starting now. But even more, as always, thank you for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you next time as we continue to study God's Word together. God bless.